Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and this is another interview, a director interview as part of our Alternative Education Film Festival. Tonight it's Peter Kowalki, the director of Grown Without Schooling. Peter, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I, you know, I loved this film. I especially loved seeing CompuServe on a computer screen <laughs> and having somebody mention Pokemon. Uh, now, how, how the movie's not as old as I want to believe it is. Two thousand and one. Yeah, yeah. It was it was actually shot in two thousand, but yeah, it was released in two thousand and one. So you know, at this point, it's uh, you know, thank goodness this message is timeless because uh, it's yeah, it's been around for a few years at this point. Yeah, it, it is a really interesting film. I pr personally really enjoyed it. We have four children three of whom did a fair amount of homeschooling, and so I was able to relate to a lot of it. And I also can look at it through the eyes of traditional educators because in many ways I represent them through my conferences, and, it, and I really enjoyed sort of seeing what you did with the film. Um, we talked a little bit before the interview started about how much different it is right now to make a documentary film than it was in 2001, but can you give us some idea of the scope of this project? Yeah, um, you know when we started out, started out conceptualizing this documentary, we actually asked ourselves, do we want to edit it with a linear editor or a non-linear editor? This was like well before the days of Final Cut Pro, and I don't think people realize how hard it was back then to make a documentary. Um, you know, we we uh, we spent many thousands of dollars on our equipment, and you know, if you watch the documentary now, you know it's not that impressive anymore. Um, but you know, we we uh, the technology was actually a big factor for us back in, in 2000 um, because the the equipment just wouldn't let us edit long enough periods. You know, we would like have to reboot our computers and shut everything down and close processes, and you know, we could only do I think between 8 and 15 minutes at a stretch before we had to put it to tape. And, you know, that really affected uh, how we did things. Obviously, the cameras were much bigger back then, and, you know, we were still working with tape. We weren't, we didn't have the hard drives, and it was, it was a lot harder to, to scrub through it. And so, uh, you know, the, the overall production took, oh, about a year and a half to do. Uh, we were on the road for, for a, a month straight, and uh, go, actually visiting all these grown homeschoolers because we wanted to see how they lived, you know, in context. And then the editing just took forever. <laughs> you know, now I do Final Cut Pro now, and I'm just like, oh my god, it's so much easier. How did you finance the film? Um, well, you know, we knew that. Well, our, our our target audience really are for people who are already homeschooling. We the one of the reasons that the film um, was made was because. There was a lot of uh, discussion about homeschooling, but it usually was pretty hollow. There were those people who thought homeschooling was horrible and would ruin your kids, and then there were those of us who were homeschooling who were just like promoting the heck out of it, and, and it was making it be just amazing thing. So, really, the documentary was to say, okay, let's. We're not trying to. Um, we're not trying to be a puff piece about why you should homeschool. Everybody who's watching the film is already homeschooling. We're already on the same page. Now that we don't have to defend it, what is it really like? What are the real challenges? What are the real issues? You know, and and so our audience for the documentary was uh, was homeschooling families, and so because of that, we knew that you know it wasn't going to be on PBS, it wasn't going to be in theaters. So we relatively narrowly uh, uh, you know focused our audience on the homeschooling community. So that was conferences and direct sales. So we actually financed it. I financed it on my own actually. Um, and uh, you know, within I think the first year we had paid it off, so it worked out. But and now uh, you're a millionaire, right? Of course, <laughs> you posted the film. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> it helped that that seven day period when we were charging one million per view. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's, how we, that's how I made my millions. Yeah. It doesn't play like a film for homeschoolers. I, 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 and that's naive of me, I guess, to have thought otherwise. But as I watched the film and as I watched the way you segmented it, yeah. I thought, you're addressing every concern that people have about homeschooling. Can they be productive adults? What's it like to grow up? Can they get into college? How will they socialize? So I actually didn't see the film as being made for homeschoolers. I saw it from the perspective of 
here's what somebody might ask. And, and to your credit, if you view it through that lens, the film doesn't sugarcoat. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, so yeah. let's start there. Mm -hmm. Because the opening few minutes with um, Peter, Griffin. Peter Griffin. Okay, Peter's a mixed bag for me, mm -hmm. the opening of that film. Because there is a degree to which he's not conscious of, or maybe he is, but you feel a little bit like he's not even fully aware of, a, of the awkwardness that he projects in describing himself. Yeah. Did, were you aware of that at the time? Am I oh, even absolutely. close? Absolutely. I mean, that, that really was one of the major goals of the documentary. You know, the, the truth of the matter is that every homeschooler questions the decision. You know, I, I do a podcast called the Unschooler Experiment Podcast. And, and it's called the Unschooler Experiment because every homeschooling experience is an experiment to some degree. There are no two look identical. And so especially in the early years, but even today, uh, you know, there's, there's this, this idea in the back of your head, like, am I going to turn out all right? Are these things going to be okay? And to the wider world, you may, you know, have all these questions figured out. You may say, oh, socialization, no problem whatsoever. But in the back of your head, you're, you're wondering a lot of the time. Not all the time, not every person, but you do have those questions still. So the documentary was like, okay, we're not, we don't need to sugarcoat it because we're not trying to impress anybody. We're trying, you know, homeschooler to homeschooler to talk about these issues and really get to the bottom of this and to, to, sh to share and, and make sense of it. So, yeah, I mean, it, it works for people who don't homeschool and aren't homeschoolers, but... Um, actually, we when the documentary came out in 2001, we had a lot of people who really loved it, and then we had a lot of people who did not like it. I had homeschooling advocates who just just wrote me scathing letters. It was very controversial um, because they felt like you know the, we weren't putting our best foot forward. You know, we we weren't sugarcoating it enough. You know, our subjects had bad teeth. Oh my goodness, and they did because we weren't sugarcoating it. Well, except that's, to me, one of the great strengths of the film mm -hmm. is that it shows that there are a variety of experiences and there are a variety of outcomes. So it isn't just one story. I mean, that kept coming through to me, which was you would show this particular person who felt confident and successful, and then you showed someone else who said, you know, I, I don't, I've never met somebody. I don't know if I'm going to get married. I'm not confident in my career. It felt very real to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had more than 50 hours of footage, and obviously the documentary is like an hour and a half. So, yeah, we, we had a lot of that awkward and puffing up and all that stuff, and then we, we just skipped all that. We went right to those revealing moments, and the, the, the stuff that resonated. And, it, you know, we, when, we made the, when I made the documentary, I, I tried not to do like a voice of God narrative uh, you know, narration. I, I tried not to be like, here's how it, they turn out and here are the issues. I didn't want that kind of thing because I really, I was trying to leave it open-ended enough that each person could bring their own uh, observations and baggage to the, to the, to the film. And, and I think overall that, that works actually. I, you do get wildly different responses to the documentary based on where your background is. Um, the, the, the project I would love to see, sort of the pie in the sky project, would be a very similar version of those who went to a traditional school, yeah. right? Because it would be, it, in many ways, it would have a lot of the same variety. And, 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 the under, you know, yeah. and of course, you know, these aren't scientific methodologies yeah. that are being oh, used yeah. to choose the people. Yeah. But it might, in, you know, in some sort of interesting way, uh, having that comparison would show that both experiences ha have variety and have people who have very different experiences within them and the outcomes can be can vary widely. They do, although I think, you know, at least my reading of the documentary, um, it, it did, there were some trends, I think, that could be pulled out of it. And, you know, I, obviously I chose just 10 people and obviously there are many others with different experiences, but being a, a grown-on schooler, you know, and I, I, by that point when I made the documentary, I had been going to homeschooling conferences and speaking on grown homeschooler panels for years. And in some regards, this was to bring those panels to people who couldn't attend. And so I had heard this over and over again. So when I made the documentary, I tried to it's not scientific, but I tried to really represent the range of the sort of responses I was hearing on these topics. 
And I think when you put it all together, you do hear some, there is some commonalities. There is some, you know, there, I think you can tease out some lasting influences uh, to the, the homeschooling experience. Okay, that's our, that's our job tonight, is for you to tease those out, and we'll go through the categories. Um, but before we do so, um, uh, let's clarify, for those who might not know, the difference between unschooling and homeschooling, and how was the film received across those two different groups? Yeah. Um, I think that there... You know, we the difference between homeschooling and unschooling. Uh, homeschooling is a very broad designation that is anybody who doesn't go to school, or at least that's the definition that I understand and use. So that encompasses unschoolers and school at home people, and you know, no matter how you do it. Unschooling, on the other hand, is more uh, self-directed learning. So unschooling can mean that you take classes or school at home, but it's not imposed upon you by somebody. It's something that the, the learner themselves will impose and always have the ability to opt out of at a later time. So that's the difference between unschooling and homeschooling. Homeschooling is the broader uh, designation. Unschooling is you know, child-led learning, you know, self-directed learning. Um, how is it received uh, by each of these groups? Um, you know, that's a very interesting question because I, I don't know if I've ever been asked that question. Um, you know, I, it's true that probably, I mean, if, if you read between the lines, more of the people in the documentary are unschoolers, although we did have both types. Um, I think the home, the unschoolers had more love and more interest in it and, and more concern about it too because I, I think that that group is less sure of itself. Um, because it isn't following a, a curriculum, it isn't following what it knows to be right as much as the, 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 uh, the school at home or the people that rely heavily on curriculum. So I think that for people who are, you know, the people who are most trying to make sense of the experience are the unschoolers because, you know, every experience varies more, you know, varies widely and just the act of unschooling is, you know, it's scary sometimes. Yeah, that certainly comes out if we're teasing out some of these themes. I mean, one of the themes was, um, for me at least, this sense of a, a little bit of fear. Are, the, are people going to just, we're not in school, or, you know, are people when I'm on a date going to stop being interested in me because yeah. I'm um, a homeschooler or unschooler? Yeah. Uh, was that a theme for you? It absolutely was a theme, yeah. Um, you, you know, one of the more traditional school at home types in the documentary was, uh, uh, I think she was 28 at the time, her name was Emily Murphy, and she had a more structured homeschooling experience. And it was interesting because she was a little more traditional and a little more sure of herself. And to my eyes even, you would say, well, more well-rounded even. Um, and, and, yeah, I think that, that there was less confidence for the unschoolers. You know, there was, there was wild successes and, and more wild failures, too. And uh, there certainly was more questioning going on. That's so interesting. Okay, so let's look at the, the, this, the first part, adulthood. I'm, okay. I think the first part of the film was adulthood, right? Could have been. I had well. I had that on my list, and I thought well, that's interesting that it was the, that that you led with adulthood because it doesn't. I mean, I would have sort of put growing up the first, and maybe yeah, yeah. adulthood. But it feels like for sure adulthood had a theme for me, which was they're capable, productive people at work. In fact, in some ways, some of them even felt like they were more capable of going into the the adult work world because it was more, it was more similar to what they had experienced. Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, so you, I guess you were unsure that you actually started with adulthood, but thinking back, would that be why? Because that's the, because adulthood would be one of the biggest concerns about people who were schooled at home. It how is. will they function as adults? It is. You know, when when you unschool, you you know you're always looking to there there you to see if you're going to be a success and what when do you know you're a success when you're an adult. Um, you know, the whole documentary is like looking at them today. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of resources out there for on on people who are unschooling today or or thinking about homeschooling. 
but you know there are less of the you know the what are the how do they turn out you know what's the outcome of this practice and that's what we tried to look at and it was while it was instructive to hear about how they did as homeschoolers um, I, I do think we were more concerned about where it led yeah and and the outcome yeah I mean my read on it was that overall uh, you know homeschoolers were pretty good in the world but it certainly you know varied person to person yeah, that, I definitely definitely had that perception from the film, and I enjoyed kind of seeing how they interacted. And then you have this one great set of interviews with someone's co-workers, where they're sort of talking about this person. And again, I'm looking at it from the eyes of somebody wondering about homeschooling and thinking what they would think. And that actually served the purpose really well, to have other people say, oh, she's a great worker, and she gets along with people, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, so there, uh, one interesting piece for me was um, one of the men in the film talked about uh, his eyes being open to ugliness. So one of the concerns, certainly about homeschooling, is the, this idea of being sheltered. Yeah. And then having to confront uh, difficult things or not being prepared for life as it is. Um, did that come out in other ways as well? Where, did other people talk about that? They did. They did. You know, one of the challenges of doing a, a documentary of any length is that you can't include all the good stuff. So what you do include is you try to make representative. Um, you know, there are certainly some people who had their own little journeys, such as Peter Griffin. But yeah, yeah most of the comments were echoed by others, even if they weren't necessarily showed on camera. Um, you know, the question of being sheltered as a homeschooler is, is an ongoing one, um, partially because there are some homeschoolers who are pretty sheltered and, you know, they come out in the world and you're like, wow, they're nice, but they're pretty naive. Um, you know, that does happen. It does. Um, there's a question, I think, a, a real legitimate question of what do you do? You know, as a homeschooling, you know, you try to set up an environment that's healthy, but the problem is that not everything's healthy out in the world. So let's say you do a great job in homeschooling, you raise a healthy child, it's a healthy environment, you know, they're not abused, they're not bullied in school and stuff like that, you know, they have a healthy, uh, you know, uh, view on learning, but then they go out into that world and they're confronted with a lot of people who, you know, are nasty to them, who are, um, who have been influenced by these, these negative influences. And that is a struggle for homeschoolers, generally. Um, some people say, well, you should expose them early so they're ready for it. I think it's quite the opposite. And I, I think the documentary kind of shows that too, that, you know, you lay a good foundation and then you're better able to go out and deal with that ugliness. You know, instead of when you're in your formative years, you know, when you're, you're vulnerable, being exposed to that might leave more of a lasting effect. So, you know, not just in the documentary, but outside the documentary, when, from interviewing hundreds of, of grown homeschoolers, you know, they're, they're some of the nicest people I know, you know, because they're, they're, they're not as damaged by and large, you know. And, but there is, interestingly enough, and you especially see this during the college years, when these well-adjusted people who've come from a very healthy environment go out into an environment that is not as healthy in many cases, um, it's hard. It's very hard. There's a period of adjustment there a lot of times um, that, you know, it's, it's sort of like all the... the the bad things that that were that they were saved from hit them all at once, and they've hopefully they're strong enough to deal with it. But it, it can be a challenge. Yeah, you know there there can be a oh you know this is this is a lot uglier than I, I I thought the world could be. Well, there's the one college girl whose friends actually try to corrupt her, right? I mean, I, you know, I thought that's a really interesting. Series. I mean, again, you have these nice little interviews where people are saying, "Yeah, she fits in. She's doing great in college." Mm -hmm. But then you also have this little bit about, "Oh, well, we tried to get her to do all the bad things yeah. that she never experienced." Yeah, yeah, and that happens to homeschoolers all the time. <laughs> that's that's definitely a a, a little uh, you know uh, something that any any most homeschoolers have faced at some point or another. Yeah, you know, I think it. I think it's May who's described as being really comfortable talking to adults. Yeah. Is it May who does the library yes, work, yes. right? 
who becomes your wife? <laughs> yes. And after the film, right? We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, yeah. but so May does the library work, and somebody says you know, she's very good at talking to adults. And that's something I've had in my own experience, which was that youth who are treated in a, in a more respectful sort of adult way, given independence, typically tend to create relationships with adults which are comfortable in talking about deep topics. And so that's that's not an uncommon thing that I've heard, yeah. you know, that they're very comfortable talking to adults. Yeah. yeah, well, I think it comes from several, there's several reasons for that generally. I think, you know, first and foremost, you know, they're, they're in, engaging with a lot of adults in a non-adversarial, like us-them framework. So, you know, they are used to the being on the adult side, interacting with a lot of adults as equals, modeling adults in maybe a different way than a lot of kids that are in the school system do. And that, you know, naturally, I think, facilitates uh, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, ease with talking to adults. Also, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the homeschoolers are usually relatively self-aware. And a lot of things they're interested in are things that you, you you see adults being interested in too. So you know one of the things that you hear from some uh, uh, homeschoolers until they're maybe in their early twenties is this sort of like I don't really relate to my peers. You know they're just not interested in the same things I'm interested in. You know they're they're childish. I hear that a lot. Now of course you know it varies from person to person. So that means that the adults are a little easier to talk to. Yeah, I would almost say that the grown homeschoolers I know. The earlier, when they're you know just emerging from their homeschooling years, they probably are more comfortable talking to adults than talking with people their own age. There's a line in the film that, like it or not, we're going to have to enter a world created by people who attended regular school. Yeah. I'm going to check out that exactly right. <laughs> you almost did, yeah, pretty close. Okay, so let's let's dive a little deeply here, right? So yeah, yeah. you make the film. May is one of the people you interview. Uh, some short period of time after you and May start dating and then you get married. Yeah. Uh, there is a theme in the film that homeschoolers tend to be more comfortable marrying other homeschoolers and it becomes very clear at the end when you have a couple, one who is homeschooled and one who is not, and you can see the tension that it, that exists and is going to it's like you're watching the train move down the track of this couple where their their young children are going to they're going to face this issue of you, you mean the, there's one grown homeschooler who is married to a non to, yes. to who wasn't homeschooled and you're seeing the tension in that yeah yeah and especially the in-laws are saying well we're going to let them make their own choices but you yeah. can tell that two worlds are colliding mm -hmm. yeah you know it, it's you know, homeschooling can, if you do it a certain way, just be another educational practice. But, you know, it's really, it changes the way you look at the world. It's a philosophy. I've even interviewed somebody who's not in the documentary, but I've interviewed somebody who actually left. She was a Muslim, and she changed her religion after unschooling because it so fundamentally changed the way that she looked at the world. Um, so... One of the things that we were trying to tease out uh, in the documentary was do you, you know, how do you relate in a romantic sense to people who had a different experience from you and maybe view the world a little differently? Do you feel that tension? Do you have to be with people who, who had also gone through that experience? Do you feel like you don't, the people just don't relate to you quite enough? Um, and, and, you know, I... I, that was definitely one of the, the themes that I was exploring in the documentary. And some people, it's a total non-issue. And, and there were a few people, such as May, who, yeah, kind of was like, I don't know how this is going to work if I don't marry a homeschooler. But on the other hand, there's not that many homeschoolers out there. So, like, how's this working? Um, how, much of, how much of that is just practical kinds of decision-making? And how much is actually this sort of in the matrix, out of the matrix kind of perspective, yeah. that the way well, you see the I world. I think, that, I think that when you homeschool, there's the possibility that uh, you'll pick up on the idea that if you, can, if you can question something as fundamental as the school system, and it seems to work out all right to question it, what else can you question? It really deeply embeds this idea of, of 
not just going along with things, to, to ask the question, to say, why do we do that? You know, and, and, and it leads to idealism too, because when you, you know, see something that you don't think is right in the world, you're like, well, do we have to do it that way? And sometimes you do, but I do think that a lot of homeschoolers do question that more. And I do think that that mindset, uh, well, certainly you can find it in the school system. I mean, you know, there's many examples of it, more, you know, on a, on a person by person basis who went to school who exhibit that than people who are homeschooled. But percentage wise, I, I do think that homeschoolers, are of that mindset more, you know, they, they just question everything and sometimes that leads you to different behaviors um, and if it's just a behavior or two you can find somebody else I think more easily who also has that behavior or interest or belief but then there's, you know, just questioning it, like, you know, as you, as you, on the level that you do from homeschooling, it does set you apart sometimes, it does. I still struggle with it a lot of the time. Interesting. Okay, so it goes from adulthood to growing up. So one of the, the things I didn't expect from the film was this discussion of the need to get away from home. Right? And, and how some felt like, okay, you're spending all of this time at home with the same people, it's your family, you kind of got to get away. And, and others didn't feel that way. But it did. was that a theme for you, this need to sort of separate? Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Why did you not expect that? <laughs> because I want my kids to always want to be with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that uh, that was not something that I necessarily felt. Um, it, it, but it was something that many of the grown homeschoolers felt, and that they, they needed to break away. And, you know, by and large, the, the, the grown-up schoolers I've interviewed for the documentary and outside, you know, they don't rebel as much as, as uh, you know, your average person. But, you know, there was, you know, like, every, like any young person, there is a time when you need to go out there and, you know, plant your own stake and, you know, establish yourself. Uh, as a you know separate and that's kind of can be an issue with the homeschoolers because they're they do have extremely close relationships they you know it, it they're already questioning that need to rebel and so they don't by and large rebel as much but like everyone else they do need to strike out on their own so sometimes there's a tension because it's almost unexpected that they need to go out and do that it's yeah, not. It make sense. It's not a byproduct of a of a dysfunction. It's it's just what people do. But be, when you homeschool and you're so close to your family, like homeschoolers often are, it's kind of surprising sometimes. Well, the one kind of counter example is the gal who uh, ends up living next door to her parents and isn't married. And you all, you can see sort of the sense of the need to get away and, and yeah. kind of be independent. Um, so I interviewed uh, some years ago a man named Robert Epstein who wrote a book on uh, teenagehood. Uh, this tome researched uh, extensively. And his contention was that we've invented a period of time that really just sort of doesn't naturally exist in most cultures. That this idea that teenagers, that there is a teenagehood and that they are going to rebel is not necessarily a natural thing. And that in most cultures outside of sort of the last 200 years of Western culture, at the age of 12 or 13, there was a rite of passage, some form of becoming an adult, and that, that then you sort of acted within the adult world. Is that borne out by your experiences uh, thinking about homeschooling? You do need the rite of passage, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't have any scientific evidence on that. I certainly have felt that in my own life, and certainly see, you see that in people who you know, our, our homeschooling, yeah. You know, you, you do need to make that jump, yeah. And so I guess I was, your, yeah. I guess I was asking less about the rite of passage and more just about that period of time. You sort of indicated that you know, as a whole, homeschoolers maybe are a little less rebellious, they're not experiencing Yeah, they, they do seem to be, yeah. Would you correlate that in some ways, sort of specifically with the schooling experience? Do you, do you personally think that schooling in some ways exacerbates this tension between youth and adults? The rebellion, you mean? Correct. Yeah, I do. Um, because there's you're on the same team when you're homeschooling. You don't, 
you know, you're, you're different because you're young and all that, but I remember being, uh, you know, 10 years old and people just wouldn't take me seriously a lot of the time. <laughs> I didn't feel other than adults, really. I just wasn't allowed to be in that group. Um, I, I, I think that the, you know, what I've seen from talking to homeschoolers and cer certainly those in the documentary is, is that, yeah, there's, there's less need to rebel because what do you, re you, you know, you rebel from things that you didn't choose that were imposed upon you. And homeschoolers don't have as much of that. So there's, you know, it's almost proportionate to how much there was imposed upon them in their, their, in their homeschooling years. The more that was imposed upon them, the more that was not their decision. Yeah, there's, there seems to be a correlation with rebellion in there at some point. Um, but, you know, I, didn't, I couldn't rebel against my parents because I made all the choices with my parents, you know. What was I going to rebel from myself? You know, so yeah, I, I think that explains why there's less rebellion generally. I, and I don't know if I want to tie it to the school, but I, I might want to tie it to who's making the decisions. I'm sure that my perspective is colored by watching Kevin Soling's War on Kids for this series, right? But it is interesting. I mean, I think uh, you, you have to have a change in society to be able to look back on something as being different, right? So uh, if if the way that we do school continues to be the norm, we're probably not going to look back on this period of time and question it. But I think it's also quite possible that we're going to realize that what we've done to students in traditional schooling uh, is sort of the equivalent of, of the tobacco companies and smoking. Right? I mean, the, the incredible number of kids who leave damaged from the system. If, if we get to a place where we can actually look back on that with some perspective, I think we're going to say, Boy, we took kids who should have been having opportunities to make adult decisions, and we just created this nightmare circumstance. And a lot of the behavior that we're now seeing, or the disorders, are related to this uh, incredible control over kids who need some autonomy. Yeah. Um, you know, when I hear the debate about improving schools, I hear a we know there are problems, but we don't necessarily know how to fix it. Or it seems like even the best solutions are still like, this is the best to do. You know, I don't usually hear of people that, you know, besides people who design the curriculums that just think that, you know, every, all the problems have been solved and everything's hunky-dory. It's more of like, you know, well, yeah, there's problems with the school system, but how do we make it better? You know, how do we work with what is? Um, and so I think that, yeah, I think there's probably a fair amount that, that's wrong with the way that we're, you know, educating our kids in school. And, you know, I think the homeschoolers don't necessarily have it all fit out. I think you watch the documentary and you see that, you know, that, that homeschooling isn't always the perfect education and the perfect childhood. Um, but I, I think it's, it's almost like a, yeah, that, that whole idea we have about the, the school system, it, it's kind of, it does have some problems and instead of trying to play a long game and a social engineering game, we're going to be the change we want to see in the world. We, we, we might lead by example, maybe some people will join us, but really we're just trying to change our education right now and hopefully other people will follow. Um, yeah. You know, the interesting piece of that is that we tend to think of change in terms of scale. And, yeah, and seeing yeah. large well, we love to have every. Sorry, go. No. <laughs> you know, we love to. You know, the, the psych 101. We always think that what we're doing is better than it is, and what other people are doing is worse than it is. You know, it's very easy to get into that mindset of we've got the answers. Um, and I, I think that you know that's one of the problems. You know, the the night one of the nice things about homeschooling is that, you know, you you, we don't impose as much. On, on the children and on the families and you know we, we don't say I have the right way you know at, at homeschooler gets to choose and figure out what's best for them and uh, you know fundamentally that's closer to where the decision making probably should happen I keep thinking about uh, the Quakers and the Amish I know that's sort of funny but uh, there's something about systems of control which tend to gain energy and propagate Right, and so you think about the 
the non-proselyting sort of peaceful religions that uh, end up being smaller as a percentage because they're they're not doing something they're not that, proselytizing they're not proselytizing and there's there's some there's a sh there's a difference in the energy that's associated with the movement right so um, well, they, you know, I it's, love it's, it's the sense of doubt you no, know nothing ahead. nothing I know is 100% certain I mean that's one of the things that homeschooling has given me is this understanding that you know I have to walk in some direction I have to take action so you know, I do what I think is the right thing to do but you know I've seen so many instances where I've been wrong and the people who are in power have been wrong so I don't have 100% faith in anything you know I don't I, I have a 99.99% faith you know I, I think it's pretty right and you know I'll keep following it until there's something better is shown but you know I don't have a hundred percent certainty and that's why the most I can do is say hey here's what I did and why I think it's good but you may have a different experience you may want to choose a different path because who knows if I'm right or if you've got something even better going down the tubes there and I, and, and that, that's part of you know I, I do come from a faith that's uh, uh, not a proselytizing faith and, and it is smaller as a result um, but I think that not being certain is part of that, is part of why you don't proselytize. I think that you've hit on something really interesting. And I'm also interested, I mean, the Quaker philosophy of education is so interesting to me because it really is this sort of respect for the, the innate sort of divine nature of the other, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a man in traditional education circles named Pasi Sauberg who talks about Finland. And he talks about the global education reform movement. So it's G-E-R-M. And he says it's like a virus. Right? And so viruses propagate and spread not because they're good for the people, but because yeah. they're good at propagating and spreading. And so it's mm -hmm. some level we have to say, okay, so how do we, what do we do in a culture where, where, we, where we have things that we believe in deeply that are not going to be good, necessarily good at spreading, but they're really important to protect? And how do we have a dialogue around those pieces? How do we say, how do we talk about respecting every child versus high stakes well, you know, testing? Yeah. I've paused for you, but I. Yeah. You know, so I, one thing I've not in the homeschooling um, is, you know, why there's sort of some of the homeschoolers in terms of we're not trying to change. Um, I think for me, and I can really only talk about this in relation to me, um, there's this, you know, it the, the virus spreads, you know, and and because it's a little, e it's easy, you know, and, you know, I'm not convinced that the right path is always the easiest path. As a matter of fact, I'm almost convinced it's the opposite. And so I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know if I believe that, you know, we're going to reach this magic utopia because the mad, you know, the, the the utopia is hard. It's very hard, you know. It's like finding enlightenment. You know, only a handful of people are going to do it because it's really, really hard. So, on the one hand, I don't I don't worry about it disappearing. You know, I don't worry about healthy things disappearing because their fundamental healthiness makes them, you know, viable. I mean, you know, when you see healthier, like you know, you know the truth when you see it. You know, the truth has an irresistibility about it. But the tr but at least in my experience, it's not always an e truth is not always easy. So you know you're never going to get that being a majority practice because people you know it's it's so hard. You know people are going to choose the easier path, and then some some people are going to go the harder path. You know homeschooling is a not an easy thing to do. I do think it's easier to go to the school system to have somebody else tell you, you know what you should do and how you should think. And or or tell you half of you, you know, give you a framework even, you know. And as an unschooler, I had no framework. I had nobody telling me what to do. It was so scary some days, and some days it still is. You know, it took me years before I stopped blaming homeschooling for everything bad in my life because it was such an easy target, you know. And 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 that makes it quite hard in some regards. But you know, I I I. I I can't not, I could not not do it. I had the choice to go back to school. I couldn't not do it because it was so obviously healthy. Even though it was hard, it was still healthy. So, you know, there is a, I guess, a pessimism in me. I don't, I'm not actually trying to change the world. 
I'm just trying to lead a good life and do things right for myself and hopefully it'll spread but there's a part of me that thinks that because it's harder it, you know it won't die out but it won't also become the majority practice so I want to actually challenge the, the it won't die out piece <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, so one of the things that's interesting is that homeschooling is not legal in many places in the world um, yeah. And as, as we saw recently with the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the Japanese government was quite comfortable passing laws restricting the ability of the press to actually talk about what was going on. So it yeah. does feel like there's a larger issue here, right? So uh, the, 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 we sort of have the sense that, oh, but the, you know, homeschooling will always be there and people will always be able to do what they, what they want to do. But isn't there actually kind of a deeper danger? The, the you have to fight for it. You know, I don't think it'll go away, but you no, know, it's true that you have to stand up for what you believe in. True. Um, that's different from proselytizing, though. Yeah, I, I, I am. I am intrigued by the need to be to protect the right to choose. Right, this ability to be able to say, okay, uh, you may not agree with homeschooling. But I'm going to protect your right to choose homeschooling because it's really important as a society that we don't restrict and control oh, yeah. this particular aspect, and that this actually potentially translates to larger political, social political themes, right? Where we we uh, we would be unwilling to have that same level of control um, that from a government that completely restricted what we could and couldn't do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, you, you see some of those trade-offs in Asia. I go to Asia every year, and there, there, there's definitely a little more control in Asia than in the United States in many regards. And you know, and and a certain extent, people do accept it. Um, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so you had uh, growing up. Then you go. We talked <laughs> Let's about get back college. to home. I don't pretend to be a. a, a uh, a political expert, or uh, to change the world, but I, I, I certainly worked with homeschoolers. So let's talk yeah. about that. <laughs> so you have growing up, <laughs> then you have college. We talked about college. Um, do you think the college story is different than it was 13 years ago? Uh, have there been changes in acceptance of homeschoolers? Yeah, no, I think there is. You know, there was a time when when you were real audited when colleges didn't know what to do with you. Now many colleges, you know, most colleges have uh, some policy for homeschoolers. It's a lot easier to to get in because there's been a lot who've gone, gone through and you know shown what it's like. As a homeschooler it's a lot easier because you have a lot more of examples out there. And that does influence uh, how easy it is. Um, it's easier to, to mix in and to know what you're getting into. There are still some enduring issues though that I think persist such as that uh, moving from a healthy environment to one where people are out to to bite you a little more. That's still an issue. Yeah. So I, the concern that people have is how will, how will your homeschool child get into college? Right? Or, or mm -hmm. if they get into college can, can they be prepared? And I think the film does a nice job with that. Um, I think we're going to face some bigger issues, which is if you get into college and you get fifty thousand dollars in debt and you have low job prospects, we're going to be questioning that in and of itself. But we'll mm -hmm. save that for another day. Well, okay, there's, so there's then a the great little movement, you know, the the uncollege movement. Uh, Dale Stevens is is doing a heck of a job getting out the word at least about you know, well, dude, do we really need college? And that's actually something that you know I think was questioned in the documentary, and you know that was a big theme in my own life was. You know, if homeschooling is good K through 12, why is the ultimate validation of homeschooling to go to college? Why is college fundamentally different? It's still an institution, an educational institution. Yes, it has more freedoms and more things similar to unschooling or homeschooling. But, you know, there, there's definitely a strong argument that it's K through 16. And so, you know, I think a fair number of unschoolers and homeschoolers are asking that question, have been asking the question, and and I think nowadays with the internet and this the startup culture that we're seeing and you know there are there's more opportunities than ever to, to, to skip college and I think a lot of homeschoolers do go that way because they see it that it's K through 16 why did I want to go away from the system only to come back to it? Why, why is that the validation of it that's a yeah. really interesting point 
Okay, so then you talk about socialization, or you, you yeah. have a section on socialization. And then your section on final remarks really felt like it was a section on family. But, uh, okay. uh, what, were, what was the intention of the final piece beyond the family? Because that was what I really saw, was, was this question of marriage and kids and sort of that next stage. Well, you know, to be perfectly frank, it has been a long time since I produced that documentary. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I'm like back in my brain. Okay, well, where all the comments oh, are over from final remarks. You know, I, it was a wrap up. You know, it was the the little coda at the end. It was trying to, you know, we seconded it off artificially around certain topics to give it a little bit of structure, and then the final remarks were basically. Um, you know, wrapping that up, and there were a couple of miscellaneous comments that just didn't fit in the other sections, and we tried to, you know, give an overarching theme to the the people that you had sort of seen for the last hour and a half, and where they were going, and what they were focused on. Um, so it was, yeah, I mean, it was a little bit of a mishmash. It was, just, it was, it was the coda to wrap things up. So from person to person, it varied. Yeah, and sometimes it did come back to the family. So we actually had a question from the live chat from Peggy, oh, and nice. she wanted to go back to our discussion of marriage, and she wondered yeah, yeah. if the um, uh, the homeschoolers finding each other was more because of shared values than that they were both homeschoolers. It was more because of shared values than being homeschoolers. Well, I think that's part of where the values came from. Um, you know that that was the the finding the other homeschoolers was it was the it was trying to find people who thought that way. It wasn't necessarily based on the practices. Um, it wasn't necessarily even based on the values, but it was more of the methodology of finding those values. So yeah, I mean values helped, and it's true that you you get homeschoolers together and you do say, wait a minute, you're into that, so am I, and nobody else seems to be into that. That's really cool, but. I, I think on the deeper level, it was more about the process. Before we started the recording, on any no, go ahead. Yeah. Before we started the recording, we talked a little bit about. Uh, I asked you the question about religion, because there are many references in the film to people's uh, faith practices and the ways those interacted with homeschooling. And you described the degree to which there had been sort of a single homeschooling community that you feel like kind of bifurcated. Do you want to explain that better than I am right now? <laughs> well, you know, back when, you know, I, I started homeschooling in 1985. I, it was actually the year that John Holt died, the, the famous uh, homeschooling advocate and uh, founder of the magazine Growing Without Schooling, which was where we got our name from. We, we did ask Growing Without Schooling magazine if we could use Grown Without Schooling, and they gave, Pat Fringa gave me permission. Um, it was kind of sad, actually, because Growing Without Schooling stopped before we <laughs> released the documentary, so it was bittersweet. Um, but, um, you know, back then, it, there was just homeschooling. And then in the 90s, it kind of split. Basically, the, there, was a, there was a lot of uh, religious homeschoolers who did it explicitly for religious reasons, uh, not just you know, people who were religious who happened to homeschool. And that grew on its own way and made a very Christian-centered uh, homeschooling experience. And then there was kind of everyone else, and one of those big everything else groups was the unschoolers. And so I, I think that, the, and I think that they took kind of different paths. Uh, one was a little more uh, top down. One was a little more, you know, had a, did have a, a statement of faith. It did have a strong direction, and you know that was because it was built around, uh, you know, Christianity. And I have nothing against Christianity. I, I love Christianity, um, but it was because it was based around that. You know, there was a coherence to it a little bit more. And uh, a common message, and you know they were they were all the same group, and then there was everyone else who was more of like the the other category, and which was a fair fairly a lot less cohesive, and you know it, they did kind of split, and they started to have their own conferences, they started to have their own magazines, they started to uh, really approach it in a different way, and and so these two distinct communities did develop. Um, and I even think there was a book on it written on it called The Kingdom of Children or something like that uh, by Mitchell Stevens. Um, 
but you know there there was a, a split yeah and uh, you know I don't I, the homeschooling is not tied to religion in any way you really you can homeschool for for many reasons um, one of them can be faith and you know as a person of faith I think that's a good reason you know because you're to get you know there are values in whatever way that you teach whatever way you learn and you know you probably do want to have your learning being consistent and reinforcing uh, your beliefs so uh, you know nothing wrong with it um, but yeah there were, the, the communities have split yeah in our documentary we tried to uh, take people from both camps we definitely let it be known that some of the people were doing it for religious reasons uh, but we didn't make it a big focus because that was really where we came up from. We came up, most of the people in the documentary came up from a time before there was that, this big like, what kind of homeschooling you know, person are you? Are you eclectic? Are you a Christian homeschooler? Are you a radical unschooler? You know, we, we didn't have those labels and, and a lot of the people didn't have that. So we avoided that whole topic and left that for other people. Peter, I think we can kind of wrap it up. I want to, uh, I've taxed your abilities here, I know, to, to, to think back all these many years and act as though it just happened yesterday. I, I do want to express just appreciation for the film and for the work that you went through to do it. In the time since you made the film, have, have you thought about anything that you kind of wished were in it? That, that, you, that either stayed on the cutting room floor or that you didn't even think about or film? I, you know, I, I, with, the, with the equipment we have today, I mean, obviously I'd love to have done it in high def and, you know, I could have edited more tightly and, you know, various technical improvements. But, you know, I, growing, without, growing Without Schooling really was, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of. You know, I, I, it was and still is um, a powerful film and it still tells a very important message and I'm happy to say that actually there's nothing that I would want to add to that film. I think that it does encapsulate the grown homeschooler experience and you know certain little things have changed over the years sure but the fundamental question of identity and lasting influence that homeschooling has I don't think that has changed and I think that it's well captured in the documentary so I mean we I still do add to it you know I do have a I do have a podcast uh, we are starting a video series you know I've been I've continuously uh, written about and interviewed grown homeschoolers since then I mean that was maybe a third of the way through my, my whole journey as a, as a reporter on grown homeschoolers. So we've kept the conversation going, but I gotta say there's really nothing that I would add to it. You know, there was, there is a, a topic that we might include now, which is how do, how do homeschoolers homeschool their kids? That's an interesting one. But I gotta tell you, Steve, there's not much to say on that. For the, the number of times I've asked grown homeschoolers who have kids like so would you do anything different you know how does it affect the way you view your homeschooling you know and I'm waiting for these great answers that'll just like blow people's minds and will produce a fantastic interview and I get nothing because um, there's yeah there, there doesn't seem to be that much to say uh, about next generation homeschooling the the only difference is uh, the only things that people have to say on that topic are they're not as worried about it. You know, their parents were a lot more worried about the experience, but as a second generation homeschooler, they kind of know how it goes, so they're pretty relaxed about it. Um, that's really the only thing. So I'm not even sure. I mean, I would include it because, of course, everybody asks that question, but there's not truly that much to say about it. So, no, I, I, the documentary actually still stands on its own. There's, there's really not much I would add to it. Peter, I love the film. I loved it in the context of the other films we've been watching. Uh, thank you for that, and thanks for this interview. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to turn it off now.